uh, question, do we take on the punishment for the bad deeds of our children as well as the reward for their good deeds? Now, um, after, as a child uh, is growing, before he reaches uh, the age of the uh, caliph or the age that he becomes legally responsible for his prayer and becomes legally responsible for uh, his actions, uh, that child, uh, all of his good deeds uh, that are written for him are also written for the parent. His bad deeds <clears throat> are not written for anyone. Because we know that when a child dies, uh, a child dies, especially before he reaches that, that legal age uh, where a salat becomes incumbent upon him, uh, if he dies, he's guaranteed paradise. Right? And so... <clears throat> obviously there won't be any bad deeds because he's not responsible for anything. Now once a child does get to an age that he's responsible, then <clears throat> his bad deeds are written against him. However, it is still for a parent to do the best they can to try and uh, make sure that when they're calling, their call is to, to good and they're trying to forbid the evil for that child. So it's still incumbent upon the, the parents, and the parents will be questioned if they do not uh, do these things. And Shah will talk about that a little later. What can we do to find a role, mo a role model for our sons if they have none? And the brothers in the community are un unable to take note that there are boys in the community whose fathers are not in their lives. MashaAllah. Sisters are limited in what they can do with boys, especially when they reach teenagers. That's so true. And unfortunately, it's a mistake that the brothers have made. And we have this same problem in America. Though what we're, what we're trying to do, um, and it maybe can be done here as well. Well, first and foremost, I'm going to say this first. For a mother who has, a, has sons, or, or a son, and... She sees her son straying off, what she needs to do. And even before this happens, a, a, a mother and a father, and if it's just a mother, you should get a, a, some good books on the Sahaba and read to your children the lives of the Sahaba and of the Salihin uh, and fill their heads with this kind of thing. Try and find them videos about the Sahaba uh, and uh, like uh, Khalid bin Walid. A lot of tapes on Khalid bin Walid. There's a lot of videos, uh, little cartoons for kids, you know, that they can watch, um, inshallah, to, uh, to know who their sahaba are and, and to find role models in those people. And then you have a little discussion. You have to take time to have a little discussion with those kids so that they can uh, understand, you know, who they're watching and why, why they're watching it and what lessons can be learned. You know, we have to, you have to take a little extra time to sit with them, if possible, uh, to do these things. Uh, for him to be able to find role models or see at least a good model in uh, in our in our righteous predecessors, and also reading the Seerah of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, reading that also helps a great deal, and then it also becomes the the responsibility of the community, the men in the community, to come up with programs that allow young boys uh, to uh, have like a mentor, so to speak. That the brothers can set up programs where, um, <clears throat> like once every month, if not twice a month, uh, they have a father and son type of uh, gathering at the parks and have different activities, picnics, and have uh, sporting events and things of this nature, taking these young boys who don't have fathers and matching them up with, with men who, who aren't married or are married but don't have children and take them out to these parks and, uh, and, 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 and build the bonds of brotherhood. You know, have a brother's breakfast in the morning like every Saturday and invite these young men, these little boys, these young teenage boys so that they're spending their time in the masjid because one of the things that brothers need are brothers. Whether you're married or not, you, sometimes you need brothers. And young, and young Muslims, especially the preteens, they need brothers. They need to be in the masjid. They need to be around brothers who are helping them. Because when he's by himself, shaitan can do all kinds of things with him. But when, you, but when he's with brothers, shaitan's job is made harder. And he may have the inclination to go off and do something evil, 
or is sinful, but he's not going to do it in front of the brothers. But we also have to make sure those brothers are on the right path. Because if it's a brother who's already, you know, hanging out with the ladies, then this guy's going to go with, right with him. So you have to make sure that, you know, the brother that he's with is also of good stock. He's a, he's a, he fears a lot much. Otherwise, you're just going to have another problem on your hands, a bigger problem on your hands. But I know that when I, like, when I first became Muslim, um, I, I still hung around a lot of my old non-Muslim friends and saw where I was going. And I also noticed that when I was in the masjid and I was with brothers, things were different. And then I started noticing that, you know, well, if I'm going to go somewhere that there might be trouble, I used to take one of the brothers from the masjid with me. So then that way, I'm protected. I can kind of do what I want to do, but I'm not going to do what I want to do. Right? Because I've got that brother with me, keeping me in check. Right? Because a lot of us don't have the word thought to remember that Allah is watching us. So we need to have that overwatching, uh, or that watchdog factor. And so it really becomes important for brothers to create more programs for the young, and as well as you know, other brothers of you know, university students, uh, people of that age, people who graduated, new in the working world, those who are older, working world men, uh, who have big families and things like that. Brothers need brothers. Even brothers sometimes need to, you know, no offense to the women, but sometimes a brother needs a little escape to the masjid. You know, just like the sisters, they need an escape too. They can't be with these kids all the time. They need sisters. And sometimes some sisters have uh, certain ways of thinking. But they get with other sisters who are a little bit more knowledgeable and they spend time with them. And they wind up growing. Sisters also need sisterhood. But the thing is, sisters are, I think, a little stronger when it comes to sisterhood and, and being a little more communal than are the men. You know, there's nothing for your wife to... How many times have you heard your wife or your mom or your sister say, Oh, I'm going over to sister so-and-so's house and you know, we're having a little dinner. <coughs> you know, she's, prepar she's preparing biscuits and nice little sweets. And you think, Hmm, that smells good. Yeah, this is for the sisters gathering. Right? And you don't get any of it because it's all going to the sisters gathering. You know, but the sisters seem to have a lot more uh, going for them than, than, than do the men. But it is incumbent upon the men to, uh, to create activities that are going to uh, really encourage uh, brotherhood and develop brotherhood is very, very important, inshallah. I hope I answered that question for you. Uh, can you elaborate a little more about how the soul enters the fetus developing child? And next question, what about the cares of stillbirths? What happens to the, what is the bond in this case? I, I think that's the word. What happens in that case? Okay. All right. Well, as, again, as we, uh, as I mentioned in the, in the hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, hadith of uh, Ibn Mas'ud, um, that when the soul, when after the first 120 days, uh, Allah sends that inf uh, sends the, the angel or, or an angel to blow into that child a soul. And at that time, again, everything is written for that child once the soul has entered. Um, and in the case that we look at with, with stillbirths, I mean, usually, uh, if I'm not mistaken, from my limited knowledge you know, of this medical field, um, a child usually is alive first prior to it dying. And Allah does say in Quran that there'll be some of you who I'll breathe life into and you'll die at a young age. And there'll be those of you who will, who will transverse into old age but will die prior to that. Right? So just because a, a soul has been blown into it doesn't mean it can't die again. And doesn't mean it can't die immediately. That's, that's something, that's Allah's business. 
Allah has set appointed times for everyone to live and for them to die. And whether that person comes out of the womb alive or comes out dead, that's Allah's affair. Now the thing about it is, uh, these same things, if a, uh, if a child dies, a young child dies, or a stillbirth happens, it is still a mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why is it a mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because they say that when we're resurrected on that day, and we're on our way to, towards judgment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we'll be naked, and it'll be, a, it'll be hot, burning, scorching hot. That child that passed away, Allah allows that child to bring that parent drink. You see, that's a mercy from Allah. Now you think, now you see, uh, I, I've lived in the desert. I live in the desert. And I don't think many, I don't know how many of you have ever traveled to the desert. I don't know how hot it gets here in, uh, in, 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 in you know, sunny England. But for those of you who don't know how hot it really can be, you just turn on the, the eye of the oven and stick your hand over the heat. And you feel that heat and know that the time that we're traveling to Allah will be greater than that. So that's hot. And even when you're naked, it's still hot. And you're sweating prof profusely. And to be given a cool drink at that point in time is a mercy. Or you think about it when you try and fast on a Monday. Because you know fasting during Ramadan is a lot easier than fasting, during, uh, than fasting on a Monday or a Thursday. Ramadan is just consistent, it's easy, not, not a lot of problems. But you try fasting on a Monday or a Thursday. Mouth gets dry, stomach is hurting, you feel weak. You want that drink. And think when, when time of fasting ends... And you go ahead and you get that drink. How cool and refreshing that drink is. That's probably the best drink you've ever had. Because you couldn't wait to get a drink. So how will it be when you're traveling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? When all your care, you're worrying about all the sins you committed. Wondering what will be forgiven, what won't be forgiven. When the, when the, when the son will forget about his, his parents and the parents will forget about the son. And all your companions won't mean anything to you at that time. All you're concerned about is yourself and how you're going to stand before Allah. And though some of us will be in twisted shapes and forms. On top of the hot sun. That does not set. A cool drink will be refreshing. And it's from a mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And a lot of times Allah takes things away from us, but these same things are used as mercies for us. We don't see it that way. We look at it from a perspective that this is something bad, but in fact, it's a mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And sometimes you won't see that mercy until later. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. So we don't want to spend our time in things that we weren't created for. And we were created to worship Allah.
We were created to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So inshallah ta'ala will perfect that worship, will increase that worship. We'll get up and pray that those two rakats of Salat al Duha every day. We'll increase our fast. We'll increase our dhikr. We'll increase our recitation of Quran. We'll improve our character. We'll smile at people more. We'll try to make people feel warm and wanted. We'll find a new concern for the ummah. We'll care for the ummah more than we do now. We'll try and speak a good word. But we'll be strong when it comes time, when, 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 the, when the going gets tough. This toughness won't get going. Because we'll become stronger, more unified. Because we have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala behind us. And we're doing for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this will have a much more wonderful effect in terms of our da'wah. And so, in the next part of the hadith, he says that if a person has reached the age of 40, and his good deeds do not outweigh his bad deeds, then know he has prepared himself for the hellfire. I'm 33. I have seven years to go. Inshallah, to try and make sure that I do more good than I've done bad. But Allah without his, is not without mercy. He's allowed our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to tell us how to remove ourselves or remove some of the sins that we've done. And one of the one of the best things is sadaqah. He says even a smile is sadaqah. Saying subhanallah is sadaqah. Alhamdulillah is sadaqah. Allahu Akbar is sadaqah. La ilaha illallah is sadaqah. And we know again, as I said earlier, sadaqah wipes away the dhunub, the sins. And every time you do something bad, you fall in love with a good deed. He says, Atba'u say, Yadbi Hasanat. He says, follow your bad deeds with good deeds. That we may be able to have those bad deeds wiped away. Again, a wondrous gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But how is it that we neglect these things? How is it that we overlook these things? Because our hearts are not right. Our hearts are full of envy. Which Imam al-Haddad says is probably one of the stupidest things a human being could have. He says anybody who has envy or jealousy in their heart has reached the pinnacle of stupidity. Why? Because what, and ultimate, ultimately, when you have jealousy in your heart, you have a problem with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because you're upset that Allah gave somebody else something that he didn't give you. Or you have it and now he's given it to somebody else you probably, probably feel is beneath you. And because of that, you're upset. These things come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You forget that you were created by Allah from a little piece of flesh. And Allah made you into the form that you have. And He's given you everything that you have received. And likewise, He's going to give somebody else maybe more. Because there's always going to be someone who's smarter. There's always going to be someone who can speak better. There's always going to be someone who's richer. There's always going to be someone who understands better. There's always going to be someone better than you. But you get and you have what Allah wants you to have. 
So to be jealous is to say you're not content with what Allah has given you. It's to show bad manners with Allah. Because now you're questioning his decree. What kind of heart would question the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What kind of individual would forget that these gifts come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And then for him to even think or even look at himself to be better than another Muslim is also for a sign of a diseased heart. How can you look down upon someone whose taqwa may be greater than yours? This person is from Ahl Khayr. There's something special about every person that says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. Every person. Because Allah chose that person to accept deen, to accept iman. Allah chose that person. Not ever. You can see how many, how many non Muslims are walking around here today. How many of you can actually say you actually chose this deen? I converted 10 years ago, and I cannot say that I chose this deen. Allah chose me for this deen. He chose me to be amongst the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam as he chose you to be the same. So there's something special about every person that says a shadow la ilaha illallah. So how is it that we can find immunity with these people? How is it that we can find ourselves or be upset by what Allah has given them? How can we look at ourselves and be better than them? Because you do not know if one day Allah will take this deen away from you. And then what has been written for you overtakes you. And then you wind up becoming like that of the kufar, of the ahl nar. And that same person you were blasting and mistreating. And you thought you were better than him winds up being of the people of, of, of paradise. You don't know. Some people say, oh, well, he might be a wali. Who cares if he's a wali or not? The fact is, he's a Muslim. And by that very fact, he may have something inside of him that Allah may love more than what he loves with you. And you should be making dua that Allah increase that brother or that sister. You should be making dua that Allah increase that person, whatever it was Allah gave them. And that they may go further. One of my teachers was talking to his teacher, Habib Abdul Qadr al -Siqaf, And he asked, how do we move ahead of our peers? He said, if you want to move ahead of your peers, then you make dua for them that they become ahead of you. You make dua that they are increased in the gifts that Allah has given them. Increases them in the knowledge that Allah has given them. Increases them in the money that Allah has given them. Increase them in taqwa. Increase their hearts to be full of light. And that they may be of the ahl, uh, ahl paradise, ahl jannah. Because you don't know, you may wind up in the hellfire. And those people who went into paradise may remember you because you may do out for them. And Allah placed it in their hearts to remember you on that day that they were in paradise meeting. And they say, Well, where's Jamal ad Deen? They say, Ya Allah, where's Jamal ad Deen? He said, I have placed him in the hellfire. Say, Ya Allah, please pull him out. Because he made dua for us. That we would become stronger Muslims and better servants to you. And he's a beloved brother. Who treated us well. And maybe because of that, Allah pulls me out of the hellfire. And maybe because of that, that Allah pulls you out of the hellfire. So we have to wash our hearts of having envy, of having conceitedness. 
even 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 showing off and showing off in our works of worship. Some students they get with the sheikh and they think, oh, the sheikh loves me. Oh, I do all these different dhikrs, and you stand in front of the sheikh with, with what I call the pious face. Every time the sheikh comes to the town, yes, sheikh, yes, sheikh. Oh, subhanallah. But when the sheikh is not in town, you're like a little shaitan running around. You put on the face when the sheikh comes into town, or one of his one of his representatives comes into town, or you want to act like you're the sheikh once the sheikh leaves, trying to tell all the other students, well, you should be doing this, you see, and the sheikh said we should be doing this, and therefore you should do that. Oh, the sheikh told you this. Well, what he meant was, who are you to tell what he meant? Who are you to talk about what the, what you should be doing as if you have arrived? You haven't arrived to nothing except a rise to more conceitedness and a rising yourself away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You think the shaykh loves you because he's always asking you to come sit next to me. He's always asking you to come here. He's always asking you questions. It may be that you're the worst one in the room. And that's why he has you next to him. Because you might affect the rest of everyone else. Or he's using you to test the other students. So you can never think yourself great like this. Or even when you're in the room by yourself and you're making you're worshiping Allah much. You're doing you're, you're making tahajjud every night. And you're reading the whole juice of Quran in your in your tahajjud. And you start thinking, oh mashallah. Oh I, I'm I am bad. I am I'm praying tahajjud. I'm making a whole juice. It's, I've been consistent for three months. MashaAllah, the brothers can see me now. <laughs> And you're only doing it because you want to be able to go back and say, brothers, you know, we should be making tahajjud every night. And we should be reading as much Quran as possible. Like myself, you know, I pray, I read a whole juice of Quran. See, you're just doing that so you have something to say. Oh, brother, I went to seclusion and I did all this dick and I read half the Quran in, in five hours. You're not doing it for the sake of Allah or to become closer to Allah. You're doing it so you can go back and tell the brothers what you've done. And make it seem like you're a person of, of high and moral advice. You want people to look at you in high respect. The hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, he told us that one, there'll be three people who stand before Allah. One of them will be a doctor. And Allah will ask, how did you spend your time on, this, on, that earth, on the earth? And he said, I spent my time healing people for your sake. He said, you're a liar. You only spent that time being a doctor so that people can talk about how wonderful you are and how you've healed people and how much you've helped people. And he sends them to the hellfire. He brings another person, a mujahid. And he says, how did you spend your time on this earth? He said, I spent my time fighting for your cause, Ya Allah, and the establishment of Islam. And he says, you're a liar. You only fought in my cause so people will talk about how great a majahid you were, how wonderful a warrior you were, and sends him to the hellfire. And then the third person is a scholar. And they'll say, how did you spend your time on this earth? He said, I spent my time, Ya Allah, reading and memorizing the Quran so I could teach it for your sake. He said, you're a liar. You only did it so the people can talk about how much Quran you memorized and how smart you are and how sharp you are. And sends him to the hellfire. So how can we be a people who want to do things other than for the sake of Allah and have Allah intended in everything that we do sincerely sincerely so we again have to look at our hearts and make sure that we're spending our time in these things that are asked of us these things that we are to be concerned with these things that are going to bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we have to learn how to become better friends better sons and daughters better mothers and fathers 
Calling people to La ilaha illallah. Calling people to remember Allah. And why? Because of the guarantee of death. Death is going to befall everyone in this room. When it comes, Allah, only Allah knows. But we have an appointment with death that I guarantee you we will not be late for and we will not be early. And the question is, how are we going to meet death? When that angel comes, will we look at him as a friend? Or will we look at him as an enemy? There are many stories of when the angel of death comes to, uh, to a man, a Jewish man once, and he was rich, and he was in a room with a lot of ladies. And a man came into his house, and he says, Who are you? How did you get in here past my guards? And the man didn't say anything. He just stood there looking at him. And he says again, Who are you? Speak! But then he noticed the look in that man's eye, and he says, I know who you are. He said, Who have you come for? One of these, one of these women? One of my guards? He says, No, I've come for you. He says, oh, well, wait, please wait. I need to go and give my son some money. I need to go and, 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 and straighten my books out. And he says, no, you should have done that already. And he takes his soul. Another story of a man who was standing in the field. And the angel of death came, and the man smiled and said, where have you been? I've been waiting for you. And he says, I've been instructed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow you to take care of whatever affairs you want to take care of. He says, I don't want to take care of anything. All I ask is that you allow me to pray two rakats. And in my last rakat, when I go into my last sajda, take my soul. That man made his two rakats, made his last sajda, and he took his soul. And this was a man who understood his nearness with Allah. Who understood that he was a servant of Allah. Because he knew that in such a time that you're closest to your Lord. And that's how he wanted to die, being close to his Lord. Not close to his relatives. Not close to his friends. But to his Lord who is the best of companions. This is who he wished to be with. And his soul was taken beautifully. Those people who don't want to go into hellfire, their souls go, you have to pull and they scratch because they know what's coming. The soul knows what's coming and doesn't want to leave this dunya. How are we going to be when the angel of death comes unto us? They said about Abu Huraira that if a person came to him and said, Yeah, Abu Huraira, you're going to die tomorrow. He wouldn't need to go and say goodbye to his mother and his father and his kids and his family and his friends. He wouldn't need to make up those, those salats he missed. He wouldn't need to go back and make up vicars that he, he forgot to make. He went to go and finish up reading a couple of pages of Quran that he didn't make that day or for the past three or four days or weeks or months. He didn't have to do any of this. Why? Because it was already done. So he was ready to go. Any time, any day, any minute. Are we like that? Are you like that? Am I like that? Should we be like that? Yes. Because we've been given the knowledge of death. We've been given guidance. So in one sense for us, there is no excuse. Allah has chosen us to be of the one of the greatest ummas that will ever exist. And given us the way of guidance. And we should use it. 
and practice it and make it a part of our everyday life. Because after that death comes, they say the soul will feel it will feel every strand of hair being yanked, being pulled. And that the soul will feel as though it's being cut by a thousand swords. And that's just at the point of death. It'll be an excruciating pain. Like pain has never known pain. And then after that death, we're placed into our grave. And after we're placed into our grave, after the last man walks away from the grave, then the two angels come and they ask you, Who is your Lord? Who is your messenger? And what was your religion? Anybody who answers, um, uh, that's it. There will be no, um, mm, uh, mm. there won't be any of that. Because the minute you go, um, they come with the hammer and they crack you across the skull. And they say it'll be a, such a powerful crack that all the creation will hear it except the human being. And then they say, for those who go ah and mm, they'll say, look at what you would have received. And they show you paradise. And they say, look at your abode. And they show you the hellfire. And then they leave, and then begins your torment. And they say the grave comes so close, so narrow, that one rib begins to touch the other side. And then it becomes filled with a nasty muck. And those people who were stingy in their wealth, they will find themselves with a snake coiled around their necks, biting their faith and say, I am your wealth, I am your treasure. They'll be filled with scorpions and other nasty things to torment you until that day. They talked about one story I heard, uh, surprisingly enough, from Pakistan. A very close friend of mine told me that there was a, a one woman who didn't wear hijab, loved to wear makeup. She was a model. And she went on television telling all the women, you don't have to be like this. It's okay to, you know, to look this way and be beautiful. Be you. And then she died. She was a young girl and she died. And then when they buried her, one of the men dropped his wallet in the grave. And when he went home after they buried her, and he realized, oh, I left my wallet. My wallet dropped in the grave. He went back and started digging it up so he could find his wallet and the part that he figured it might be in. And as he did it, a flame shot out at him. And he happened to get to the part where he could see her face. And he said her hair was, flat, was full of fire. She had a hair of fire, and she was scratching her face with her hands. Obviously, this, 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 this totally distorted him. And he ran off. And he told her uncle, who was a sheikh. And he said, this is, what, this is, this is the torment that she is going to incur until Yom Kiyama. So, know that this torment is real. And for those of us who do good deeds... Know that our, our graves become expanded and full of light and full of good smells and with good company. And they say for those of us who read Surah al Mulk every night, when you're in the grave and when torment tries to come to you, Surah al Mulk stands up and says, Leave him, do not touch this man or this woman. And torment leaves. And you'll say, Who are you? He says, I am Surah al Mulk. And I am your companion, for you read me much. Allah is not without his rahmah. Allah is not without his rahmah. And then after we've been risen, and we're on our journey, as I've stated before, and we walk into the intense heat, some of us will be allowed to meet the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam at the fountain and drink from his hand. Many of us will be turned away. 
Many of us will walk right by it because of what we, how we've lived our lives in this life. Won't even see it, pass right by it. Some of us say, well, I couldn't handle not being able to see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or being excluded from the drinking fountain. Well, you've got bigger problems because soon you will stand before Allah and as you're traveling you come to the Sirat who they say the his bridge is as thin and as sharp as the blade of a sword and many who walk across it will slip and fall and they're going straight to the hellfire and many of us will tra travel across it with ease we'll find our way to the other side and then after we've traveled, we travel up the hills to meet Allah. And then one of the scholars told me that it takes almost a thousand years just to cross the Sirat. A thousand years just to make it up the hill to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we're not talking about a thousand of our years. We're talking about a thousand of the years that exist with Allah and within the, in the realm of the hereafter. Which is much different. And much longer. And then we stand before Allah. And all that you thought you hid from Allah, all those nasty things you thought no one would find out about, Allah will expose you. Allah will expose you before all of mankind. All you thought you did in, 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 in secret, your little secret rendezvous with your boyfriend or with your girlfriend or with that woman that that uh, was not halal, halal to you because you were already married. Or that man, you were already married. You, snu you stole, you thought no one saw you steal. You were lying to people, deceiving people, thinking no one would ever find out. Now all of these things you've done will be exposed. And when you're asked about it, first and foremost, your book will be given to you. And your book will be given for those who are good, be yaminihi, in his right hand. And when the book is handed to you in the right hand, you will open it up and see all the good that you've done. And for those who will be given behind him, why would it be given behind? Because the angels don't even want to look at your face. Because of the, of the despicable sins you've created. The disobedience that you've, that you've committed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then you are given the book and then you'll see all that you've done. And then when you're questioned and you try and lie, thinking you're going to save yourself at the last minute, Allah will seal your mouth and your body parts begin to, to tell on you. Your hands begin to say, Yeah, Allah, He used me to steal. He used me to pick up that drink and drink it. He used me to take the money out of the pocket and give it to the, to the bartender and I took the drink and we put it in the mouth. The feet will say, Yeah, Allah, he used us to go to the disco. He took us to the club. Or we took him to the club. We were dancing all night with the women or with the men. Ya Allah, he took us to a place of sin. The private parts are going to tell on you. The private parts are going to say, Ya Allah, he used me for zina. She used me for zina. How will you stand in front of Allah? How will you stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when, when your record is being called to account? How will you stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when your friends stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and your, your sons and your daughters your mothers and your fathers 
Stand before Allah. And Allah says to the hellfire with you. But then they turn around and say, Ya Allah, wait. Take my friend to the hellfire too. Take my son and my daughter to the hellfire too. Take my mother and my father to the hellfire too. And they'll say, why? Because they did not forbid for me what was wrong. And they did not encourage me to what was right. They did not try and guide me to you, Allah. They did not remind me of your dhikr, Ya Allah. They didn't encourage me to read the Quran. They didn't encourage me to pray. They never gave me dawah. So bring them to the hellfire with me, Ya Allah. Are you prepared to stand before Allah in that state? Are you prepared to stand before your Lord and be questioned about that? When he asks you, why did you not give your friend dawah? Why did you let him go to those places? What were you afraid of? Why did, you not, why did you not keep your sons and your daughters from going out into clubs and from having boyfriends and girlfriends? Why did you not allow them to become chaste and cover themselves appropriately? Did you fear man more than you, more than you feared me? Did you fear my creation? Instead of fearing me who created these things and you? How will you answer Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How will you look at him? Are you prepared to look at Allah in this manner? And not only just from your friends and from your, your family members. Even the people you work with. Ya Allah, I would never have become Muslim. I saw that, that brother in the, in the, uh, job, at the job, and he was just, his mouth was just as foul as everybody else. His character was just terrible. Why should I become Muslim when I looked at him and he was no better than me? Why should I become Muslim when she had no conviction in her religion? She was like everybody else. I saw no reason to come to, the, to Islam. Are you prepared to hear this thing said about you? And it is guaranteed you will stand before Allah. It is guaranteed you will be questioned about the things that you've done in this life. It is guaranteed that Allah will ask you how you spent your time in this life. So it is for each and every one of us to purify our hearts, to remove these diseases from our hearts, to recognize that our, our Lord is one and He is the all-powerful. And when we submit ourselves 100% to His will, that He will protect us from any and all harm. For Allah says, when I love my servant, Anyone who wars against him, I make war against them. Who do you think will win that battle? It is for us to straighten our lives out. Because death is coming, brothers and sisters. We have an appointment. And it's coming soon. Time is short. This life is not a long life. But eternity is forever. And inshallah, Allah will allow us to be of, the, of those who are successful. In this life and in the hereafter. Inshallah, Allah will bless us to be of those of paradise. Inshallah, Allah will bless us to be of those who, whose hearts are full of light and obedience will be of those whose hearts want nothing more than to find the pleasure of Allah and do things that Allah will be pleased with us and that he will protect us and he will befriend us and he will protect us from ourselves and from the fitna of this dunya and all that it contains 
that we will not be misled by this dunya and its ornaments. That we'll be as the Prophet ﷺ told us to be, as a stranger in this life. As a traveler who is connected to nothing. Because his home is with Allah. And I pray, inshallah ta'ala, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow us all into paradise without being called to account. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow us to sit in paradise as we're sitting here in this masjid today and we'll eat of the fruits of paradise we'll drink of the water of paradise we'll drink of the milk of paradise we'll sit in the, in the soft grass of paradise feeling the cool breeze of the winds of paradise listening to the swaying of the trees in paradise talking about how we came into the masjid one day and remembered Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin Fakhatan al-Nabiyin Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Wa amma bad um, <coughs> There are uh, two hadith that I'd like to relate uh, for this next part of the session and talk about briefly uh, the first one the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he says that in the, in the body there's a piece of flesh and that if, and if it is made righteous the whole body is righteous and if it's spoiled, then the whole body becomes spoiled. And another hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that the sign, the sign that Allah has left his servant is when that servant busies himself with those things that do not concern him. And he says if a person spends from his time in this life and in, in any, or any hour of his life in things that he has not been created to busy himself with then it is befitting that his sorrow be elongated and then he says and if a person has reached the age of 40 and has not made preparation or he says, a person has reached the age of 40 and his good deeds do not overweigh or outweigh his bad deeds, then know that he has prepared himself for the hellfire. In this first hadith, thank you. In this first hadith, talking about the heart. It is important for us to understand the conditions of the heart because the heart as many of the ulama say it guides the mind and in guiding the mind what do we mean by it guides the mind because when an individual does something if he has a pure heart, he's going to do something that's right. If he has a bad heart, he's going to do what's wrong. And the only way he do what's wrong, he won't see any wrong in what he has done. For instance, a person goes over to a brother's house. And he sees on the shelf there's 100 pounds. And they're all in tens. And so he thinks to himself, maybe I'll grab three. He'll never know. So he grabs the money, puts it in his pocket, and then leaves the house. Or later on, he just leaves with the brother. If he had a righteous heart, a heart that is filled with the dhikr of Allah, a heart that fears Allah and wants nothing more than the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that heart would tell the mind, you can't take that money. 
The heart says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching you. Allah has commanded you not to steal. From the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you've been told not to steal. But a bad heart will say, yeah, take the money. In some cases, the heart won't say anything. And then after you've taken the money and you've gotten home, you sit and bask in your little bit of glory about how sneaky you were in stealing the money. But your heart doesn't tell you to think about, well, what did he probably want to use that money for? Maybe he wanted to use that money to buy extra food for his family. Maybe he wanted to use that money to buy his kids a new pair of shoes. Maybe he wanted to use that, he needed that money to buy nappies. Maybe he needed that money to pay his rent. Maybe that set of money was there for him to pay his light bill, his telephone bill. And now you've taken that money and now you're causing him an extra hardship. But the heart doesn't tell you these things because your heart is blackened. It is fouled. It is spoiled. And so uh, we have to look at our hearts because it will guide the mind. It will guide the body. If you know that if you go into this room, there's going to be danger. Or you're going to get yourself in some trouble. A good heart will say, turn around and go the other way. A bad heart will say, feet, get moving. Let's get in there. When you're sitting down and you know, you say to yourself, you know, if I say, if I say a couple of words to this young lady, maybe I can get myself a little kiss. And you know that's haram. Because you know it'll lead to greater things. And bigger forms of haram. Greater forms of haram. But your heart doesn't tell you that. It doesn't tell you to, to watch out for the haram. The heart doesn't tell you, remember, there are two angels on both sides of you. On your right and on your left. And they're both writing down all your deeds. The heart doesn't get you to remember that when you're standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you'll be questioned about these things. The heart doesn't tell you that when you <clears throat> are told to go into the hellfire, that the angels will curse you and hit you. Why? Because you made them have to sit in bad sittings. You made the angels have to write down something nasty. And every sin is nasty to the angels. You have to sit there, and, or you've made them be in a position that they have to write down a bad deed for you. But the heart doesn't remind you of these things. Because the heart has been spoiled. So, we see, or at least you should see, the importance of having a righteous heart. Because it does uh, control the limbs. It's not the mind. The mind will conjure up all kinds of things, but it's the heart that regulates the mind. It's the heart that says, okay, mind, there is a God, and, it, and we call him Allah. We have a messenger, and he is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We have a sharia. We have a law. A divine law. A complete law. A perfect law. And it is for you to be obedient to that law. It is for you to utilize the senses and all is looking into creation to realize that, there, that Allah exists and to purify the heart so that the heart can control the mind or tell the mind or remind the mind every time it wants to do something that it's not supposed to do. Every time the mind forgets, the heart reminds it. Then looking at the other hadith, when he says that the signs that Allah has left his servant is that he allows that ser servant to busy himself in that for which does not uh, concern him. And the Prophet wasallam said another hadith, he says from the, from the perfection of Islam is that a person does not concern himself with that which does not concern him. 
We find a hadith in the 40 hadith of Imam Nawawi. So if we know that we're not supposed to concern ourselves with things that do not concern us, well, what kind of things do not concern us? And it doesn't necessarily mean getting in someone else's business. Though that is one of them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I have not created men and jinn except for the worship of me. So that's what we concern ourselves with, with the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not worrying ourselves about how we're going to uh, raise enough money to, to, to pay the rent or raise enough money to buy food because Allah is the sustainer. When you need help, who do you turn to? The first person you should turn to is to Allah. If your heart is in the right place, it turns you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You, we don't call on the boss. We don't call on the friends. We call on Allah. And Allah allows uh, the friend or the boss or the parent to, to be utilized to help you in your situation. We look to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Ibrahim alayhi salam was thrown into the fire, how many different creatures came to him and asked, for, do you need assistance? To the point where the angel came down and asked, do you want me to, to stop this? And he says, no. وَحَسْبُنَ اللَّهُ وَالنِّعْمَ وَكِيلٌ And enough for me is Allah as a protector. How many of us turn ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and busy ourselves in what we've been created for and that's the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we're not just talking about well, are you praying your five prayers? Are you fasting during the month of Ramadan? Are you giving your zakat? Are you, have you made your pilgrimage? Are you... Uh, Guiding people or calling people to what is right and, for, and forbidding for them what is wrong. We're talking about the perfection of these things. When we pray, sure we get up here and pray, Allahu Akbar. But are we in, are we looking at the perfection of the prayer? Are we in a state of, of khashur, reverence for Allah? Do we pray with hudur? With the presence of Allah? Or are we praying thinking about what we're going to do after the prayer is over? Are we thinking about uh, the job? With a couple of things we have to do at the job once we finish praying? Or the, what we have to buy at the store? Or do we stand in our salat seeing nothing except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? When we make our dhikr, are we making dhikr and looking around? La ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah. Looking at everything but not concentrating on what you're saying. One of the Sahaba had to get an arm cut off. And he said, Well, before you do it, let me make dhikr. And he made dhikr and he was so intense with his dhikr, they cut his arm off and he didn't even feel the pain. When he stopped making the dhikr and came to, the arm was already severed. This is doing things with a sincere heart and doing things with certainty of heart. This is moving from a point where we all, many of us stand, where we have what we call the surah of Islam. Meaning we have the picturesque of Islam. We're not moving towards the reality of this deen. The trueness of this deen. So it's not just enough to say I pray or I fast. It's about having perfection in these things. When I fast, am I just going without eating? Or am I spending my time in dhikr? Reading Quran? Making sure I don't, spend, I don't use any uh, uh, bad language? Am I being helpful? Am I lending a helpful hand 
to the people, be it Muslim or non. This is from the perfection of song. It's not just, I'm going without food and drinking, I'm just walking the streets, <laughs> I'm fasting. When we, when we enter into Ramadan, which is coming upon us, how are we going to spend our Ramadan? Fasting, but we're still listening to the music? Driving down the street, rocking to the beats? Head bobbing to the rap music? Are we going to turn that off and listen to Quran? Are we going to try our hardest to read the Quran? Are we going to cry when we read those ayahs of Quran? Are we going to try and feel the trueness and the depth of, the, of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to us in the Quran? Are we going to spend our time in dhikr? Are we going to improve our, our characteristics? Because these are the lessons we should be learning during the month of Ramadan. Not lying, not deceiving people. Not using profane language. Not cursing anyone. Showing humility to the brothers. Though in front of the Catholics, you do hold your head high. But not out of proudness. Are we looking for the completeness of our fast? As the poet said, he said, Al Eid, Laysa Liman Yelbasu Jadid, Al Eid Liman Ta'atuhu Yazid. He says that the Eid is not for someone who wears new clothes. He said the Eid is for the man or the person whose worship and obedience to Allah has increased. And from the increasing increasement of our obedience to Allah, it carries us to the next Ramadan. And then we increase it to the next Ramadan. And we increase it to the next Ramadan. Because we're seeking the perfection of, of fasting. And understanding the trueness of Eid. And when we make our pilgrimage, do we make our pilgrimage and just, you know, we're just walking around with, with Zara on and uh, with, with Ihram and walking around and saying, oh, mashallah, mashallah, I'm here. Or do we look to try and come, become close to al haq to the reality, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Do we try and become closer to Allah with every step we make? When we walk to Mina, when we go to Musdalifa, when we go to the Jamarat, when we go and stand on Arafat, do you reflect on the fact that prophets have been here before you? Do you reflect on the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to answer the dua if you are sincere? Are you trying to find perfection in your hajj? Or in giving your zakat? We can't just be concerned about just doing actions. We have to look at perfecting these actions and truly tasting the fruits. The Prophet Sallallahu said one of the things he loved about Salat was the coolness of the eye. How many of us can say we've experienced the coolness of the eye after Salat? And how can you experience the, the coolness of the eye after Salah if you haven't prayed properly, if you haven't reached perfection in your prayer? You've allowed, sometimes you allow yourselves to think about everything else. You can't remember what rakat you're in. Was this four? Was it three? Uh, two? You can't even remember if you recited al-Fatiha. So we have to look for the perfection of this prayer and the perfection of every action that we have and not busy ourselves with those things that take us away from achieving the perfection of worship and the wholeness of Islam. We can't allow ourselves to get busy in other people's business and other people's affairs. And just even a small example, you're in Salat and you know the mistake of the person next to you. 
And for the rest of the salat, you're thinking about this mistake. You're thinking about how you're going to tell this brother or this sister about the mistake they made in the salat. But see, you've busied yourself with somebody else's salat, not paying attention to your own salat. You haven't paid attention to your own prayer, and you, can't, you don't even know what mistakes you've made. Because you've busied yourself thinking about the person next to you. Is he going to wiggle his finger or not? Is he going to hold it straight or is he going to just stick his finger and put it back down real quick? We're too busy worried about what the next man is doing not worried about our own selves. So we wind up busying ourselves in things that don't even concern us. And we're, we need to look to uh, achieve perfection in our worship. And when we don't do this, then rest assured that this is a sign that something's going on with you. Something's wrong. Something is not right. And it's for you to look quickly to figure out what it is and what you're doing. And to try and straighten it out. And so therefore Allah says that if this person spends an hour of his time in, in things that we have not created him for then it is befitting that we do what we prolong his sorrow his sorrow when well there's two things you're going to deal with the sorrow in the grave and the sorrow after you've been resurrected because for many of us we'll find bliss in our grave and for many of us we're going to find torment in our grave how long do you think that torment will be? Think about it. From the time of Musa alayhi salam to now, how long is that? How many years has that been? How many people are still in their grave from that time to today? Think of the torment that, that those people are going through in their graves from then until today. And know that it's going to be even prolonged even longer. None of us know when the time is going to come. When we shall be, when all will be wiped out and then be resurrected once again. And how do you know you're not going to be the last man to be resurrected? That's a lot of people for you to be the last one. You don't know. You're unsure. You haven't even got a clue. But think of the torment that you'll be going through. Reflect upon the torment that you may go through and the sorrow that you'll feel. And then after being resurrected, and as you're on the traverse going to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, think about the torment, the sorrow that you'll be dealing with. You know, one of the things that, that, that really uh, is a, a real powerful thing is called anticipation. When you're anticipating something, it eats at you. Take a small example of a child. When you say, okay, tomorrow we're going to go to the park. And all of a sudden, every five minutes, is it tomorrow yet? Is it tomorrow yet? Is it time? Is it time? And then as soon as the next day comes, they wake up out of sleep. Oh, is it time? We're going to the park now? Because they're anticipating going to the park and playing and running and having a good time. Now how will it be for us? Waiting to meet just to stand before Allah. That in and of itself is frightening, especially when you are contemplating all the sins that you, you have committed in this life. And you try, you try and think of all the good things you've done, but you can't think of them because you're too scared and too worried about all the things that you did do. And you have to deal with that all the way until you stand before Allah. And even standing before Allah becomes something powerful because you don't know how He's going to judge. You don't know if he's going to say, enter into paradise for my mercy or enter into the hellfire and, and receive the reward for which you uh, have, have, have developed from how you spent your time in the life prior to this.